Hello, hello, good evening, good evening, good evening. And I seem to have lost Rupert. I don't know how I've done that. Let's see if I can get it. Oh, hey, hello, everybody. <laughs> that was clever of me. <laughs> As ever, so pleased to uh, see you folks here. Uh, hoping you're having a very pleasant evening. I hope we don't spoil it wherever you are in the it's world. It's evening for everybody. We've got, to, we, we've got to, um, people from all over the place here, haven't we? Uh, hello, yeah, Dale. Yeah. What time yeah. is what time is it in California? Um, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I mean, uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, so many friendly names I can see, and so many friendly faces. Uh, you'll have to forgive us that you know sometimes stuff goes by in the chat, and we don't we we can't have eyeballs everywhere. I'm afraid. We um, try. It, we we do try. We keep our eyes uh, on it. But uh, forgive us if we miss stuff as we try to uh, keep you entertained for the next, what, however many minutes it is. Mm. We're all here. We're all here for a, uh, a watch party. And uh, the Standing with, the watch party, the Standing with Stones watch parties were, uh, seem particularly popular. So we've uh, trawled the rest of our oeuvre to see what else can we can <laughs> bring in for a watch party, I'm afraid. Uh, as uh, you know, the output over the past couple of years wasn't that great. Well, it was great in terms of content, but uh, numerically wasn't that great. Um, yeah, yeah uh, the tonight uh, episode, uh, watching um, our film about the Devil's Quoits in Oxfordshire, um, I think runs to the end of what's possible as far as a, a watch party is concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, before we get into the watch party, there's a few things we just need to, well, we'd like to uh, chat about. And that's, firstly, the things that the tracks are going down, the wheels are starting to turn under the juggernaut that will be standing with stones too. <laughs> And uh, one of the primary things that needed to happen was for us to be able to, um, you know, if people wanted to help us, uh, it's no good us talking about it unless we can invite, you know, you into what's happening and, and ways that you can help us. So we now have the channels open, uh, Patreon as it's always been, but also we've now got a, a, buy, me a uh, buy Me A Coffee campaign where people who may feel uh, prefer not to commit to monthly uh, subscription that they can go there and buy us a coffee um, go well not literally but um, give us a small uh, amount of their choosing should we say one off yes. uh, like that you're going to say something Rupert you know I was just agreeing with you it, it just it, it I, I find it quite funny that when we started this off I don't even think buy me a coffee was was a thing no. and uh, we and we used to talk about uh, subscribing for the price of a packet of crisps yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and we're, we're kind of there now, aren't we? Buy me a coffee, packet of crisps, whatever it's. Uh, I think that there is that option. You can change it to buy me a packet of buy me a pint of beer, or buy me. A, it, we could have buy me a packet of crisps, uh, but uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so yes, I, it's, uh, it's picking up momentum. Yeah, and, I mean, we're uh, very yeah, early uh, stages, but, um, you know, I hope uh, to get as many people on board as po possible. Yes. Um, actually, you know, to, to which end we've we've prepared a little uh, sort of promo film to tell people uh, what we're doing with Standing With Stones uh, 2. And with your indulgence, I'd like to show that to you now. All right. Do that. And then, then you can heckle us afterwards. Indeed. All right. <laughs> Roll VT, as they say. Imagine, let's go back four and a half to five thousand years into the Neolithic period. Twelve years ago, we made a feature length film about the ancient sites of Britain and Ireland called Standing with Stones. And we both loved the stones, and it really was a passion project for both of us. Yeah, we gathered a dedicated band of faithful fans over the years who always said that they wanted us to do more. Yeah, well, we listened. We did. And we're back. Hey! hey. And for the last few years, we've been making podcasts, short films, doing interviews, and loads more about prehistoric archaeology. And of course, we now call ourselves the Prehistory Guys. And we're still listening, and it seems that when it comes down to it, 
you want us to make another film. So not to beat about the bush, that's what we're going to do, and this little video is about how you can help us to do that. Right now we're pulling together our ideas about the story we're going to tell in Standing With Stones 2, and towards the end of the year we'll begin the launch process for a Kickstarter fundraising campaign that'll power the actual production of the film. In the meantime, there is work to be done, and there are two ways you can be involved starting right now. A, through monthly subscription, and B, with a one-off donation. We already have a wonderful Patreon community that you can join. And that's really the best way to get on the inside track with the development of the new film. And of course, all the other stuff we do. Our Patreon folk get masses of content that no one else does. And uh, we keep them up to date with everything we're doing through regular live chats and shows. On the other hand, if you'd prefer to make a one-off donation that'll go forward to support the production of the film next year, we've got a Buy Me A Coffee campaign going, so you can do just that. There are links to both routes to helping make this happen and where you can get more info down below in the description. And a big thank you if you take the time to have a look. In the meantime, thanks for listening. We look forward to seeing you around. Bosh. There. Cool. I hope you hope you approve. Um, I think, if I remember rightly, I got ahead of the game and I actually put the link to the Buy Me a Coffee campaign down in the in the description below. Anyway, I know most of you there are already our fabulous uh, Patreon uh, supporters. Anyway, not expecting you to put your hand in your pocket any more any more than that. <laughs> but uh, uh, anybody that's uh, new to the game here and uh, knows Standing with Stones. Um, yeah, uh, please consider uh, joining us. Okay, is there anything else we need to say before we get going? Because I think we first, uh, that's enough of that. That's enough of looking yes, inward. That's, yes, enough, that's of enough of that. no, gazing at the navel. Um, that's enough of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're just, um, we're just busy plowing on. And, you know, the research for Standing With Stones 2 is, uh, is big and ongoing. Um, Meanwhile, of course, we keep uh, uh, we keep doing our best to put out regular other stuff. So it's yeah, it's it's nonstop, but good fun. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Mm, I haven't got anything else to say. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Um, and uh, we're talking. Um, we're we're create. We're doing a prehistory moot. Um, Patreon folk, you'll know what that is. We're doing it tomorrow morning. Yes. And we'll be yes. talking more about uh, what's happening with Standing with Stones too, in yeah. that, and uh, you'll get that um, sort of sometime over the weekend. Okay, enough of that. Um, let us give some background to the film we're about to watch and uh, comment on, and give the background to uh, R Rupert. How did it all begin? Mm. Well, ironically, it all began because your sister went out for a walk. <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Rosie, Michael's sister, uh, yeah. uh, uh, phoned Mike up and said she just found a new, a, a new site that she'd never heard of before. She stumbled across it quite by accident, walking the dog, and uh, uh, and we didn't know about it either. Uh, so we went and had a look, yeah. and it's it. You know, I mean, the crazy thing is, is actually turned out to be, in our opinion, one of the most important sites in Britain. Yeah. Um, it's you know it's not that well known and it's uh, and it's not talked about which is really why we went and made this film mm. and you know you'll see from the film but basically it's uh, a site that has been so meticulously reconstructed that it actually gives you the clearest example of what a henge would have looked like to the best of our knowledge. Obviously, we've still got, as we talk about the missing horizontals all the time, you know, we don't know mm. what else might have been there. But of the stuff that we're certain about, yeah, it's uh, it's remarkable. Yeah. Um, I keep looking down here because I actually have the excavation report, um, which is as rare as hen's teeth now. Uh, mm -hmm. You can probably get your hands on a copy, but that's ridiculously expensive. But this uh, is, uh, he said, going the wrong way for the camera, but that is all excavation report. And the level of detail is utterly breathtaking. The research that they did to find out, you'll see in the film, but uh, yeah, you know, we can yeah. stop in and talk about bits along the way. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, quite frankly, uh, uh, the Devil's Quoits um, kind of knocked our socks off, really, uh, mm. didn't it? And mm. it, it was the first film we made after getting back together again. Um, you know, we're talking, we were, you know, talking about this, what, three years ago, uh, wasn't it? We were looking around for the, for the first film we were going to make uh, as yeah. the new yeah, Standing With Stones troupe. We weren't even prehistory guys then. Um, no, we weren't. Uh, and and this was the first film we made uh, after Standing with Stones. Strangely enough, uh, to, it was mm. uh, it was 2018, wasn't it? All the way back then. I My think goodness it gracious! Was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, think. yeah. Mm. Um, uh, anything else, everybody? Needs, uh, it, uh, Devil's Quoits uh, near the village of um, Stanton Harcourt, uh, which is yeah, near in Oxford. Uh, yeah. Oxford. Um, yeah, I, do people re need to be primed with the knowledge that it basically it was a flattened site? There weren't any uh, stones there apart from one that was left over. Uh, well, so I think we what tell you them that in the film, don't we? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think so. So uh, I, I won't um, plot spoil that uh, <laughs> that bit of it. <laughs> Shall I roll the film and let's see Probably how we too. get on? Yeah. yeah? Right, then. All right then. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, you'll recognise this first shot that comes up. It's the same first shot as it in the, the, same the promo yeah. film. <laughs> yes. Imagine, let's go back four and a half to 5,000 years into the Neolithic period, the new Stone Age where it grazed the boundaries of the Bronze Age. Populations would have been tiny by modern standards, but even back then, Britain was a buzzing network of thriving communities. We know... From modern technology, we found that some of the animal remains found in the south originally came from Orkney, and that axe heads from Cumbria have been found as far afield I've as got northern to... Europe. We know yeah, there was a trade route that I'm, ran I'm all the stop. way from the far Scottish Isles you, you, right you the way down to the really south coast of Britain. Huh? And that shared culture ran through some of the most impressive sites ever to be constructed across the British Isles. I've got a bit of a techie the problem here. Orkney, it's the third largest stone circle in Britain. And on south to the vast sites like Knowlton Henge in Dorset. And yet, here, Oxfordshire's best kept secret. And a site of immense importance for so many different reasons. Why is it angels? This is the Devil's Quoits at Stanton Harcourt. I'm just going to stop it there, uh, Rupert. If you'd like to talk a, a bit about the surroundings there, because it's obvious from the aerials that it's in a, rather an unusual position. I, I was staying quiet because I thought you were struggling with tech there because you were going to stop it earlier and then you didn't. <laughs> uh, that, that's right. I have uh, the the video wasn't running very smoothly, which is why I'm in, inclined to stop it. See if I can do anything. But uh, well, one, as I say, if you things, can address those things, uh, Rupert, while uh, I just yeah, well, source there's, there's the a different few files things, uh, down that little line. Uh, and one is uh, we talked about uh, the some of the remains, uh, so cattle, for example, uh, that uh, uh, an isotope analysis showed that they came from Orkney. Um, now, since uh, that was announced way back when, and you know, gasps of shock and wonder and all the rest of it, that there have been another couple of places brought up which are probably more likely, still amazing, um, and that's uh, that uh, they could come from the West Country, which is, mm. is more likely, but it still means that people were bringing cattle 
hundreds of miles uh, to come to a place. So, you know, it, it, it's still significant from that point of view. Um, looking down, those aerial shots, uh, now what you can see from a lot of that is that there is a, uh, there's still a gravel works, there's a rubbish tip, there's, there's a whole industrial uh, place you know, all the way around it. it the, the thing that's so amazing is uh, about the site overall is that uh, it, it has been so utterly destroyed in the last century uh, that it's an absolute miracle of architectural, architectural, of archaeological analysis and reconstruction that you see it the way it is. And, and it's because to reconstruct it from... Uh, you know, we say in the film, we say in in a, in a couple of minutes, but uh, it was it it was completely flattened over f uh, to be a, an air force runway in World War Two, and uh, and <laughs> so to reconstruct it from that, the analysis that they did just uh, just carefully excavating every single stone socket, and uh, in fact, I can show you some of. Uh, these in here that so for example each of these uh th those are the exact uh, dimensions and slope and everything of uh, of different sockets there's loads of these uh, and uh, so you know just the calculations of how big was the stone then how tall you know um Obviously, you can't say for sure exactly how tall it was, but you can say from, uh, you know, you, you you know from every other site that's ever been excavated that you get a quarter to a third of the length of the stone that it is above ground. You get uh, below ground, so uh, so you can calculate to within you know pretty close um, estimations of uh, so you, you you get to the bottom of the pit, excavate to the bottom of the stone socket. And you can have a pretty good guess of how tall the stone actually was. So the the reconstruction overall uh, amazing. The only thing that's not right, really, is the uh, is the height of the bank and the depth of the ditch. But the depth of the ditch is deliberate. We'll talk about that in a minute. Height of the bank, just because <clears throat> unknowable, sadly. Yeah. yeah. Again, just you can make a best guess, but. Um, Yes, uh, anyway. and uh, I have uh, at the moment I, I have run into major technical problems. <laughs> Dear. Um, it, yes, because I I can't get my screen back. I've lost, um, I've lost you all, and I can't. I've lost oh, control of the program basically. Oh um, no! Yeah, so I don't know quite what to do. Um. Uh, uh, well, wait a minute. I've got, uh, I've got a. I've got no idea. Yeah, sorry if you can. Don't, That's all right. Don't, don't I'll pay any attention to me. I'll, yeah. I'll keep talking while you're struggling. <laughs> yeah, if, um, if you would. But uh, yes, I mean, if you can imagine that when they were doing those excavations, so um, because half of it had been grab, uh, quarried out for the uh, the adjacent. Uh, gravel extraction uh, company half of it had been flooded um, also because of the gravel extraction uh, the stones that had been remaining some of those were taken away and buried um, because I suppose they were just getting them out of the way for the uh, for the runway um, but uh, but so there is only one stone now in the uh, in the circle that is original um and and the rest of them are just uh, you know they found stones that, that that as far as you could tell from the depth of depth and size of the sockets then they found stones that uh, that were the the best fit uh but what's so remarkable about it all is that being able to measure all the dimensions of the site so you you could say precisely you know, how wide was the plateau? What was the diameter of the plateau? How mm. deep was the ditch? Uh, by extrapolation, roughly how high was the bank? They, as I said just now, they, they haven't actually reconstructed those, I think for more than one reason. These days, 
because of health and safety, you couldn't uh, you couldn't dig a henge ditch back to its original <laughs> its original proportions because it would be dangerous. Uh, and if humans didn't, then animals would be falling into it all the time. Mm. Um, uh, but uh, the, but the, you know, remarkable yes. things like the the berm. So where you've got uh, the so you've got the bank, and then you've got the berm, which is the flat area between the bank and the uh, um, and the ditch. Um, so it's almost like I mean I. We still say, you know, this is like arena sort of uh, stuff where you could walk around the outside of the arena to find, you know, where you were going to sit down before you climbed up the bank to uh, take your place. That's really what it's like. Um, obviously can't say for certain that that's what it was, but that's certainly what it appears to be in our mm. eyes. Um, yeah, yeah. You're still struggling? I'm afraid I am still uh, struggling. Uh, the my, <laughs> the entire program with which I run the show has disappeared from my screens. Yeah. Um, oh. I've never had a, oh. a oh. an issue yeah. like this at all. Uh -huh. Uh, and and the trouble is that if you do a reboot, then you're going to cut me off as well, aren't you? Uh, most likely, yeah, um, because I control <laughs> the, the program from here. So I'm, I'm at a bit of a loss as to n know what to do. Um, um, well, I'll answer some other questions then while, uh, while you're yeah, yeah, doing pl that. Yeah, please do. I think, uh, have, uh, have a cut wish off me luck. where you just stop worrying. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right good luck. Um, uh, Genie X? Genie X. Uh, great handle. Um, were there any animal bones found? Oh, yes. Many. Many. Uh, predominantly cattle bones. A huge amount of cattle bones. Um, which... Uh, you know, you have to <laughs> you have to ask the question. You know that you you get the the go to explanation for um, uh, for so many henges that they were temples. Well, okay. Well, why have you got a gazillion cattle bones then? If it's a temple, unless obviously they would say it was a temple to the worship of the cow. Well, why are they all dead then? Uh, you know, there, there's no burials of uh, of in t intact cows. You know, this is all random leg bones and things like that. Uh, so that's uh, you know that that's quite interesting. There were a lot of bones, um, uh, very little. I think there was a certain amount of pottery. I don't actually remember off the top of my head. There was a certain amount of pottery found. Um, in fact, quite a bit, copper objects and what have you. But it's but predominantly, uh, you know that. Uh, it's definitely animal related. Uh, any indication that the cattle were butchered? Um, actually, no. Um, Imagine. Let's go back <laughs> four and a half to five thousand years. That's me interrupting. It's the Neolithic. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> that's all right. Um, mm. uh, no, but um, that in itself um, is—it's uh, one of those that doesn't mean it wasn't. Um, Okay. Oh, I'm going to be back, and I think uh, you back there, Rupert. I'm here. Fantastic. That's <laughs> amazing. I tell you what, that was perfect timing because uh, I I can I've just found the relevant page uh, in the excavation report, so if, um, I will uh, I'll read a little bit out. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to. Uh, shut down as much as on my computer as I possibly can right. um, because uh, I don't uh, have any, uh, any more glitches like that. Uh, bear with me uh, for a moment, folks. Uh, I have to say... We'll try to make sure that uh, normal service is resumed. Yeah, well, well done for hanging in, folks. I think, yeah. uh, do you know what, when you think about it, it just illustrates, though, how much this is just still such science fiction. <laughs> the fact that we can have, you know, that we, we are collectively, we are from all over the world and we can still come together and do this. You know, if we have one night in a few hundred that uh, that it goes yeah. uh, a, bit, a bit wobbly, that's yeah. pretty good going, really. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let me try and uh, get uh, back to uh, the, the film, see if it runs a bit better. Obviously, it set itself back to the beginning. We saw that. 
and the end. Shall I, shall I run it now from here? Yeah, yeah. go on. So why is this place so important? Well, most significantly, it was virtually destroyed over millennia. It was ploughed flat by medieval times. It was even the site of an Air Force runway during World War II and half destroyed by gravel quarrying. So everything you see now is the result of the most breathtaking research by archaeologists to analyse every conceivable aspect and piece it back together again to its former glory. Well, within reason, the bank would have been twice that height, and the ditch would have been twice that depth, although they've left that here for good reason. What you're seeing here, this is actually how it would have appeared during the Roman period, but the archaeologists have left it here because that way all the Bronze Age remains are completely protected beneath this layer, and they can come back and excavate those at a future date. Intriguingly, a cluster of post holes were found here, right in the centre of the circle, which could well be the remains of a timber structure. But before we go rushing to call it the centre of religious activities, we should probably bear in mind <laughs> that every open construction site needs a central space for supplies and protection. So this could just as easily have been where all the workmen ran to when it started to pour with rain. You're a naughty boy, Mr. Suskin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling it like it is. <laughs> the thing is, no other site has been so meticulously researched and restored, giving us the clearest glimpse into how these sites would have appeared all those thousands of years ago. And whatever activities were going on inside, whether it was markets, or circuses, or rituals, or religious ceremonies, this place was designed to impress. Yeah. It's such a, it's a beautiful site. Well, it certainly was on that day with the low sun going across it, yes. isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, perfectly lovely. Sorry, you were going to say, mm. Rupert. I just there's quite a few things that I want to uh, uh, pick up on along the way. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we make no bones about the fact that uh, that <laughs> sorry that's a terrible turn of phrase to use for this. Uh, yeah, we make a lot of bones about um, uh, about hinges and the like that we think they're to do with animal husbandry. Um, that not always, but often arenas or farms or whatever. They're to do with animals, in our view. Uh, a couple of you have uh, have asked questions. Uh, Jeff, you uh, you said was there a sign of signs of butchery, and I found the relevant point in the oh, well research. Then. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically, I'll read this out. It's not very much. Uh, it says. Uh, there's a whole table related to different bones. Cattle, sheep and goat, pig, horse, red deer, um, and red deer antlers. Okay. Um, and the number is the numbers are overwhelmingly cattle. There are odds and sods of other animals. I mean the horse yeah. bones uh, uh, four no. Sorry, one it's percentage it's giving there. The one horse bone they found, um, you know, and like half a dozen red deer, uh, sheep and goats, half a dozen cattle, mm. hundreds of them. Um, so it says, um, blah, 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 blah. Most elements of the skeleton are represented. The skull is apparently absent. However, several upper teeth are present. And fragments of skull were recovered, but are not definitively identifiable as cattle. 
This is true also of the vertebrae within the ex uh, uh, with the exception of the more easily identifiable axis and atlas. Other missing elements are smaller bones such as tarsals and phalanges. Whilst these are not so small that they can easily be missed, it is possible that this is why they are absent and that no special selection was made during deposition of the bones. In other words, when they were actually burying them, it's, you know, if they didn't, if they didn't pick up all the bones, then that's why, you, you, uh, in fact, that happens in human burials as well. There's finger bones missing just because when they, from excarnation, you know, when they were mm. gathering up all the bits of body that they didn't all <laughs> end up in the burial. Mm. Um, uh, with so small a sample, it's pointless to carry out any analysis of the relative frequency of the different elements. Suffice it to note that the better represented elements are the more robust bones, which have better survival, <clears throat> excuse me, survival rates than the less well represented, uh, represented elements. One important point to note is that six of the specimens are very large for Bronze Age domestic cattle and thus have been noted as possible aurochs. Yeah. Turning to the ageing evidence, it's possible that there are a few young individuals represented. All early or middle fusing bones are fused with the exception of one distal metapodial. <laughs> you know, I hope you guys know what I'm talking about because I don't. Well, I do a bit, but you know. Uh, and the majority of the teeth are permanent teeth, so they're not, the, not that young then. The four mandibles with teeth tell a different story, however, as three have deciduous dentition present and the fourth, any of you dentists? Um, you just, you started fourth, talking dirty. <laughs> <and I'm laughs> uh, with the third molar at where state, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to read all of that. Just gibberish, gibberish, gibberish. This apparent conflict is hard to resolve, but it's not uncommon. For A few of the bones bear evidence of carnage chewing. So although dog bones are not actually represented in the assemblage from layer G, it's evident that dogs were present. I like that kind of detective work. You say um, carnid, I say canid. You can say what the hell you like. The weathering condition of the bones makes it difficult to discern both chewing and butchery. So the apparent lack of the latter and scarcity of the former need not be representative. The only bone that definitively appears to have been butchered is an ulna, with the general state of fragmentation is typical of butchered refuse from sites of this period. So, in other words, there is very little uh, evidence for butchery, but there is a tiny amount. And so it might mean that there was a lot more butchery than than you see yeah. in the in the records, just it's weathering that has taken those signs away. It's a distinct possibility. Um, Geographia Sacra says, are there any invest?" Are there any investigations about cattle age? Uh, well, yes, you've kind of just answered that. He's yeah, uh, been studying, that, yes. or I've been studying, I don't know, uh, studying a, a lake settlement in Italy where cattle bones belong to young animals. Archaeologists say young animals are connected to ritual offerings. It's possible. Uh, interesting, it's possible. yes. Equally, Although we do tend, uh, equally, we do tend we, to slaughter young anyway. Um, yes, because uh, uh, because you know you can't wait forever for an animal to mature and give you more beef. Uh, yeah. Let's face it. Look how much veal we still eat today. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know. Uh, it, so I, I don't necessarily so, think that uh, the 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 young age of animals is rep I mean, it could be, it could be, but yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I, I I think we we make these kind of sweeping things, ignoring the way we still treat animals today. Yeah. I don't think we're fundamentally different, uh, yeah, other yeah. than in the um, the numbers of animals we, we get rid of. Uh, there were a couple of other things. Uh, green Dragon, uh, <laughs> if I can call you Green Dragon, asked <laughs> about uh, the, uh, uh, the ditches. Were the ditches, you know, could the ditches have been specifically so that animals did fall into them? Um, no. Mm. Uh, well, okay, it's not to say they couldn't, but the thing is that it is distinctly possible that there were fences anyway to stop them falling into ditches. Yeah, we it's don't all know. the stuff we don't see. We can't, uh, uh, yeah. But we, uh, we have also uh, thought many times about there would have to have been some means for getting down into the ditches. You know, many of the bigger henges, 
the the banks are high and the ditches are ridiculously deep there are so many henges that i mean Knowlton henge for example in somerset uh that that ditch was 17 feet deep um yeah. avebury it was 30 feet deep now the thing is you could you could drop your coca-cola a bottle down a, a a 30 foot deep ditch and want to go down and get it you could drop your car keys down you know and what's a neolithic man going to do if he can't he can't reach his car keys um you know there would have to be uh ramps or you know whatever there would have to be means of getting down into the ditch for whatever reason and there, you know there's even the possibility for example that we know that a number of the henges did actually uh, collect water in the ditches. Uh, so it's not impossible, you know, if, if they were used as farms, for example, that, you know, maybe there were ramps mm -hmm. that went down so that the animals could actually drink in the ditches before coming back up. Uh, you know, there's, but there's I, all but sorts. The, of... Yeah, there's all sorts. I, but I think that the uh, the the sides of the banks would be steep sided, so I'm not mm. sure that would be. A, I see them. You know, when I stand uh, adjacent, you know, at uh, Knowlton, at uh, Devil's Quoits, at Avebury, um, they feel so. Pr they're there as a barrier. They're, they're not a trap. Yeah. Uh, they're there as a barrier. What this. Um, Devil's Quoits is one, uh, and shoot me down if I'm wrong, Rupert, but my recall is that there are burnt areas in the ends of the ditches where, uh, where the entrances yeah. are. The at the, at yeah. the terminuses of the, of the ditches, the, there are signs of burning. And when I, was, when I was actually standing there, looking at through the entrance defined by the terminuses of the uh, termini of the uh, ditches there, for the first uh, inkling... And I, I sort of imagined burning fires in those ditches, and I thought, well, what better way of preventing whatever animals there are from trying to escape to through the entrances? Yeah. Um, um, if you if you if you've got a ditch, it's all very well, but if you've got a flat area, a connecting area that's a sort of <laughs> a leak in your trap, as it were. Um, then burning in the ends of the uh, ter termini uh, of the ditches um, makes absolute sense. Mm. I don't know if that's, uh, that's true, uh, but um, it's a I think it makes total to sense. Play with. So when, when I talk about ramps going down to the ditches, I see them as being ramps from the causeways. Um, yeah. so, so, so you walk, you have the, these strips of land uh, forming the entrances uh, and and so you could have ramps going down either side of that which could easily be uh, be fenced off uh, mm. you know you, you've got to remember as well that this is a, a, a period in Britain when uh, there were still bears and wolves and all sorts of you know links yeah. uh, you know that uh, that would have been a threat. So, uh, so the henge ditches they could just as easily be about keeping mm. uh, wild animals out as keeping domestic animals in. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or, or even if we're totally yeah. wrong and they really are temples, then you still have the same thing that it's it's yeah. a way of protecting yeah. um, whatever is on the inside mm. from the the wildness of the outside. Devil's Court is one of those wonderful places uh, where y it's hidden from view as you approach it, um, just the way it, it is now, threading your way between you know the, the old uh, quarry ditches and and all the rest of it. And when you arrive at it through this sort of uh, wooded w walk, it is a, a wonder, a, another wonderful reveal, and you're forced to mount the bank to reveal the henge inside in, in and it's one of those places where you you just get a, such a sense of an arena again as you mount the bank it's uh, i think it, <laughs> it's the first time you see something is the thing that the impression that lasts with you and if you approach devil's quoits from a you know a different angle maybe uh, maybe you get a different impression of it but uh, this wonderful uh, reveal and the sense of 
a place that has been laid out so people can see what's going on, you know, like a football pitch or what have you, any kind of arena. One of those places. Mm. Anyway, I see you're gazing at the uh, chat there. Uh, uh, I am, yeah. Know? It's uh, Kieran has said, Hi, Michael. Any chance of rotating your camera and giving us a look at the system you're running? <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> uh, no, my camera is right, is quite a way away from me, and it's on a tripod, and to bring it round, it would destroy the whole room. <laughs> yes. uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the system hand, I'm running. If you're to in... show you what system he was uh, running on the day that oh, that we were filming at the Devil's Quoits. The, the system. Oh, the system I was running at the Devil's Quoits. Yes, we can do yeah, that. I think Kieran is talking about what you've got in front of you there. I just thought oh, it was yeah, funny yeah. because we were talking earlier on about uh, the film that I was shooting of you when you were shooting. Oh. I see. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. uh, the the thing um, I I use to uh, do the broadcasts is I'm on a Mac and uh, it's Ecam Live, um, and it's never let me down before in mm. years of using it. So it's pretty robust. I don't never know mind. I never mind. Uh, Nava says, "Can they tell the breed of horse and uh, and carnid from uh, why? Yeah, uh, why, yeah, why?" <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's all right. I'm just laughing now. And Michael says canid, and I say carnid. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't care. Um, can they tell the breed of horse and carnid from such a few bones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it, it's certainly uh, reasonably easy to tell the difference between uh, aurochs uh, and domestic cattle. Uh, horse and and carnid. Yeah, that that you can generally tell the difference between uh, between wolf and dog. And uh, and you have to bear in mind that uh, that at this time there there weren't as many breeds of dog as we've got uh, today. We've yeah, got yeah. mental with uh, messing dogs up. Yeah. Uh, horses. I don't actually think we had that many different species or breeds of horse in Britain uh, in the Neolithic. I, I think probably only two or three. I'd have to look mm -hmm. that up to be honest. I'll write uh, Keith, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I don't think I've ever thought in terms of them being, uh, of the bank and ditch being protection for the inside. It's about stuff being able to escape. That's the fundamental thing about the ditch on the inside and the bank on the outside. It serves two purposes, you know, it's the natural form of containment, but also you've got the... Um, You've got the the added benefit of providing a bank for people to to watch the stuff on the inside from. Yeah, uh, do you know, I think it's a very important point because, uh, and one of the reasons that we uh, that we think that a lot of these were arenas is because there are certain henges, and I think Abingdon is a good example. I have written about this actually in the Stanley with Stones book, uh, but. There are some of the henges that are double ditched. Uh, so you've got a ditch inside the bank and a ditch outside the bank. And the excavations show that the ditch on the inside, so if you were sitting on the bank and watching the spectacle, the ditch on the inside is very clean and neatly cut. The ditch on the outside tends to be a lot more messy. And uh, these double ditched henges almost always appear, as far as we can tell, where Either it's on gravel, as it is, uh, you know, similar to this. Although this is only a single ditched henge, um, or the uh, the underlying bedrock is uh, is relatively close to the surface. Now the implication of that is that if they wanted to uh, construct a bank that was high enough to take that many people. If the bedrock is too close to the surface, then in digging the ditch, you're not extracting enough soil to make a high bank. So you make as much as you can from that inside ditch that you make as neat as possible. And then the second ditch on the outside, which is purely to give you more soil because nobody's looking at that. That's why it's messy. And it's just an extraction of more soil to increase the height of the bank. Uh, so, uh, you know, you wouldn't do that. I don't think you wouldn't do that if you weren't um, building it for seating. What would be the point? Um, 
anyway. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, you, the book will be out eventually. It will. <laughs> and it'll be there will. in plain black and white text, and clear. Know, we've and... been, yeah, we've been working <laughs> on this for such a long time. And the trouble is that all the more pressing things, like Standing With Stones too, uh, you know, they, they tend to uh, make that go on to the back burner. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it will. It will happen. Do you, do you know what? Uh, mm. Rupert's been uh, talking rather a lot tonight. And you know what, folks? He's going to talk some more. <laughs> <laughs> there is no doubt that the community here was large. Apart from any other remains, the surrounding landscape holds more than 70 ring ditches, the remains of mounds you recognize and burials. the bookcases, folks. Now, that is more than <laughs> double the number to be found in the landscape yeah. surrounding Stonehenge, which is only about 50 miles to the south of here. But perhaps more informative is that a lot of animal bones were excavated here, 90% of which were cattle, and some of those were particularly large and may have been aurochs. Also interesting, the ditch, it seems, was never intended to be kept tidy. Some of the time it was completely overgrown at the base and the walls were stabilised by thick vegetation. And to be honest, this site has really forced me to question a lot of things that I thought I knew. I had always believed, and I still do, that these vast sites were public. That first impression, when you climb the bank and you see that central space for the first time, it's one of grandeur. And yet the archaeology here just leaves us a void. The lack of pottery, for example. Does that mean it was never here? And maybe this was just a farm. You know, what better way to protect your animals than to surround them by a ditch? Or maybe they, the remains were here, but they were always cleared away after every party. And in actual fact, not far from here, there's a massive Bronze Age rubbish tip waiting to be found. Then again, maybe these sites really were places of religion and ceremony. We can't avoid that possibility. But if this place really was a temple, then why are there so many cattle bones? Don't know. Anyone would be forgiven for being absolutely horrified to see a site as magnificent as this, surrounded by industrial warehouses and workings. But then again, a monument as imposing as this has probably always been lying right at the heart, not just of people's busy lives, but the centre of commerce and industry of an entire forgotten culture. In all probability, the only thing that's really changed is the scale. There we go. I'm not going to let the titles run because that's boring. Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, so I was just going to say, anybody, did anybody register the rabbit holes? And uh, Graham did. Yes, it is. Uh, it's absolutely run over by uh, yeah. rabbits. The uh, the bank and ditch yeah. there, and uh, it's a pity actually because it, it does quite sp um, spoil the aspect of the uh, uh, of the ditch. The number of rabbits there, but what do yes. you do? Um, I uh, and a couple of things here. Matt says the berm looks too wide compared to others I've seen. Uh, I think it's purely and simply because uh, there's so few that have been properly excavated. Yeah. Uh, the ones that have been properly excavated, you know, I mean, you get a sense of the size of the berm at uh, at Avebury, but not really. They were wide. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, uh, really, if they serve the purpose. Elsie uh, says, why does it have to be single-use? Arenas today oh, are not. And absolutely, absolutely Elsie. Yeah. I mean, 
uh, we we have actually not tonight, but we have actually made that very point many many times. That mm. uh, as you say, arenas today, well, you know, it's a sporting event one day and it's a rock concert the next, or it might be a Jehovah's Witness yeah. meeting the next, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, and the same applies to church halls or jazz clubs or you know, I mean, we we just you mm. know we agree with you a hundred percent. I think that um, if <laughs> if we're right about them being uh, animal husbandry related, then then yeah, you know, I mean, you you look at how many uh, how many county fairs you have. That's exactly what the, I was going to say. The, yeah. Well, yeah, because you know the the, the farmland, uh, you know that uh, that it will become a, a show site for uh, for a couple of days or what have you. It's mm -hmm. uh, you know you're, you're spot on. It wouldn't I, be a I think, thing at all. Yeah, absolutely. I'll say, I, and if ha I had to pluck one analogy out of the air that I think describes hinges and their, their function, it is the modern day agricultural show, you know, in which at a particular time of year, people come from all over the country to share their expertise in farming, hunting, uh, you know, animal husbandry, uh, any aspect of you know, <laughs> getting food out of the land. Mm -hmm. It's something that people, uh, seems people uh, need to, to be able to share that. And I think I, it, this was brought home to me, particularly anybody that s saw um, the prehistory show uh, from last year in which I went up to uh, Thornborough Henges up in uh, Yorkshire. You know, you've got the triple henges there and uh, I was reminded I uh, was not very far from Harrogate where the Great Yorkshire Show takes place. Is, that, is, that, is it the Great Yorkshire Show? Yeah. And there are correlations. If you look on, you know, from an aerial down onto a showground, they may be square now, but you've got the same sort of cluster of arenas doing different uh, things, uh, you know. So I think the correlations are, uh, are are very strong, and it's the direction we should. Uh, it's the lens we should look to. It's which is a, I like using that phrase, the lens we should look through. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a couple of things to uh, to pick up on here, um, Eric says hi considering modern humans have been around uh, about three hundred thousand years it's only the last ten thousand years or so that we've been modern your thoughts on this please um and uh, yeah again uh, it, it's um it's an interesting point isn't it that uh, every civilization that you can name uh, every civilization that we really know about uh, has been within the last 10,000 years, and yet you don't have to go 300,000 years, but say even the last 100,000, when you know we've been pretty sophisticated, that, uh, that no, there's plenty of time for civilizations to have risen and fallen. Uh, and there have been, <clears throat> in fact, Mike and I were talking about this just the other day, that one of the intriguing things is uh, there's some research being done uh, about a, 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 a probable comet strike from 13,000 years ago that uh, would have caused such devastation that, it, you know, if there were any significant civilizations around then who weren't leaving anything in stone, then there'd be nothing uh, left to find of them anyway. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it's possible there could have been any number of... Uh, of things that we've completely lost sight of. Mm. Um, one, uh, Genie. one, yeah, go on. Uh, so, no, one answer to a question. Um, oh, 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 I've lost it now. If it, it was about if there was, if it was about animal husbandry, then why have uh, the stones? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Well, the stones is a. a it, very important for permanence. Um, I, I think if you've got the stones as a framework for whatever timber uh, stuff on the inside could be uh, re restraining stuff, um, I, I think that's all also a way of uh, looking at the function of stones within these kinds of, uh, of places. Uh, the, the stones themselves weren't functional, functional just by themselves, 
um, they were a permanent structure around which you could construct, you know, the horizontals, uh, the mm. stuff that uh, actually did the job of, of creating a whole circle. Uh, mm. uh, that the stones are just there to uh, as a as a as a permanent structure uh, around which yeah. you construct. Um, yeah, from from an engineering point of view, you know, if you if you think that, uh, so if you, if you look at uh, stone circles generally, uh, um, and not just stone circles, but the timber circles as well. Uh, so there are a number of palisaded enclosures, and the same thing applies that they were using the biggest trees they could get hold of. Um, some of them, you know, you take places like Stanton Drew, uh, not just Stanton Drew. There's so many where the uh, they used uh, extremely mature oak trees that were up to a meter in diameter uh, so now you sink those six feet into the ground uh, you know or, or even you know a meter and a half into the ground uh, that the reason you would do that is because uh, you know if animals are pushing against a stone um, you know, it has to be that deep in the ground for a cow not to knock it over. And yeah. it is interesting that if you go to somewhere like Yellowmead in uh, on Dartmoor, uh, yes. which is the quadruple <laughs> stone circle that in the film we just showed, there's so much animal crap all over the place. Uh, but the thing is that those stones are still, you know, the taller stones, um, the, the, the animals, the, the Dartmoor ponies still use them as rubbing uh, posts. And you think, well, they've been standing there for 5,000 years and the animals come up and rub their backsides on them and they're still standing up. Now, I think, if those uh, also stones the, the, were I, I think uh, maybe hats, the ground, off to, they, hats off to the uh, Dartmoor, um, uh, what is it, the Restoration Association? I mean, there are people yeah. that actually <laughs> yes, look after them. And, it's and, true. But, uh, but you again. can see that, it, you know, if, if, a, if a stone was only a foot in the ground just to keep it <clears> uh, standing yeah. for aesthetic purposes, then an animal coming and rubbing against itself against it uh, would sort that out in no time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Keith, uh, Keith uh, Gerard, so, so, Keith, Keith Gerard, uh, how does this fit in with Mike Parker Pearson's theory of wood for the living stone for the ancestors? I think uh, Mike Parker Pearson's theory of that is strictly applies to uh, Stonehenge, um, as far as I can make out, because his friend from Madagascar, whose name escapes me, was the, the chap that alerted him to that possibility. And they were specifically talking about um, how Stonehenge was uh, uh, arranged with relationship to Durrington walls and the fact that you've got the blue stones and uh, all, uh, all those things. I've never heard Mike Parker Pearson try to apply hit that um, th that th theory outside of the uh, Stonehenge environs have you Rupert I haven't no. no I mean you've tried to you did you tried to in <laughs> in, in the did. chamber at Brinkethley um, <laughs> B uh, for what it's yeah. worth you know just hands yeah. up you know, full disclosure yeah. and all that uh, but we did well the, the thing <laughs> is that you 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 get you get different opinions and I'm looking over there's um uh Lordy, Lordy, Mike, help me out here. I'm having another well, senior moment. I'm looking on my bookshelf one. for... Um, it's not Inside the Neolithic Mind. That's another great book. Um, oh, it might be Inside the Neolithic Mind. It is, it is, Inside the Neolithic Mind. Um, yeah. There's some wonderful theories in there about, um, you know, possible psychology and uses of materials. Uh, in prehistory, and they kind of echoed that theory, and oh, it, dear, it was yeah. just, it was, um, it was relevant. I think you know because standing with stones was you know was uh, was very much a voyage of discovery on so many levels, mm -hmm. and so you know we uh, we were just offering as many different opinions or or uh, conceptions. As seemed sensible. I, I mm. mean, if if you want to ask me from a personal standpoint, do I go with the timber for the living and wood for, uh, for <laughs> timber for the living and stone for the dead? Um, possibly, possibly. I certainly don't think it's ubiquitous. Well, the, uh, no, but but I mean that whole theory is in you know in opposition to uh, uh, Tim Darvell's um, theory about the. Um, 
bluestones being for healing, and I lean towards uh, Tim's uh, interpretation uh, of that. Um, no, Spike, we're not saying that they would be nothing more than a cattle enclosure. Um, the, the, we're saying that the, the shape and the form of them speaks to, um, as part of their function, having to restrain the movement of, of animals. That it, that for whatever purpose was going on, animals needed to be restrained within that enclosure. And, you know, not just animals. That They were arena... It wouldn't just be... Uh, the observance or, uh, you know, uh, games with animals or, or, you know, that kind of going on. You know, all sorts of other things, you know, mm. de people demonstrating their skills in other areas. Uh, mm. People like to compete, you know, whatever the equivalent uh, of a football match would have gone on. But the equivalent of, uh, you know, all sorts of games, just games. Sometimes, mm. uh, you know, that requires an animal or two. Sometimes it, it mm. doesn't. If you're demonstrating hunting skills, if you're you, know, you, you only have to go to the Colosseum, you have to go to what the Romans were doing in arenas with animals, and, you, you know, your mind goes a bit, ooh, I hope not, but why, mm. why not? <laughs> mm. Human beings are weird, and, uh, yeah. you know... Well, well, See, there's a thing. See, Chubby Moth says, but wouldn't a rubble wall suffice? These are communal efforts in the extreme. And I think that's the very point. You know, mm. if you want to create seating, and that's why we have this, you know, why we feel so strongly about this. If you want to create seating, then the easiest way to do it is to raise a bank. And how are you going to raise a bank, dig a hole to get the soil? Um, uh, you know, now you could... Certainly, you could just take surface. You could just, you know, if you wanted to, for example, you could just keep lowering the platter, the, the inner circle, uh, and, you know, and scooping it up and scooping it up and scooping it up to make the bank. Um, but then you'd have no separation between the viewers, the spectators, and what was going on mm. uh, in the, uh, on the central plateau. Now, uh, you know, contrary to, you know, this isn't fanciful. If you go back, uh, some of you will have heard us talking about this before, but if you go back to the Roman games, now the Roman Venati were the animal-related games, and these would be played, uh, played, good grief, uh, in, the, uh, in the arenas, in the big arenas. Um, and tens of thousands, in uh, in some cases, many, many tens of thousands of animals were dispatched in a single games. Um, and uh, the, the, the individual sports themselves were pretty lavish. They would put different animals against each other, you know, like put a bear in, a, in the arena with lions and that kind of thing. Uh, but then they would fight people against animals and what have you. And the thing is that the the spectators were separated from the central part of the arena by uh, a ditch, and uh, uh, and uh, they were on the raised area. So now, if you think there's a design, uh, a spectator sport design in the Roman period, well, who you know, it's not a big stretch to say, well, that's just a, a more modern version of a hinge, surely. Mm, um, mm. And it is, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and you can go back to, you can look at sites like, um, Mike, what is it in Dorset that Sue's been uh, Mount Pleasant. excavating? Thank you, Mount Pleasant in, uh, um, in Dorset. Um, We're doing an now, interview with Sue Greeny about her excavations Tuesday. on uh, oh, yeah. Mount Pleasant next Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Now, the thing about Mount Pleasant, is that you look at it today and you get an idea, but that's just because of how much we've let things um, fall into rack and ruin in very mm. recent past. If you look at, at William Stukeley's illustration of Mornbury Rings from a couple of hundred years ago, then ah, you can see without any question at all, that's an arena. Absolutely mm. no question at all. It's an arena. Mind you, the Romans had been at it by that time. Uh, yeah, that's true too. But, but you know, <laughs> yeah. but it, it kind of it, yeah. it makes the point that there are so many things that you know they're just. Tidying but the Romans came up along and said, "Oh, that's a good arena." <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. 
Uh, we came across something uh, quite recently by accident. Well, not by accident, because when you start looking, when your eyes are open to uh, stuff from any direction, we came across um, the uh, Basque uh, Country Games. I can't remember if that's Rupert. What? Yes, you're right. What? But the, the bar. Oh, sorry. I thought you were. Um, I was wanting support from you as far as what the they were called. Um, oh, um, it, it, well, it was it, Basque, it, wasn't it? It's uh, country uh, games. Is, yeah, yeah. And uh, just to and illustrate the point, I can't lay my hands on it now. Unfortunately, I came across a wonderful photograph, and it's, it's taken. It's a black and white from from the 1920s or so, something like that. And it's got, it seems to be taken from inside what looks like a henge, but a henge that has got uh, stands and uh, a roof over the, over the bank. And it's looking oh, from yeah, inside, yeah. And, and there's there's a couple of Basque farmers, gentlemen, sort of looking into the arena. And inside the arena, there's a couple of goats going at it. <laughs> you know, so this game this thing about setting your goats at each other uh, was a sport in the 1920s yeah. or whatever it was and it yeah. it just it just it just spoke to me for the sorts of things that are going to have to have been going on it, it they'll occur as weird and we can't yeah. probably imagine you know what the things were but the interesting thing of course is the basque people have the most uh, you know some some of the most strongest genetic connections to the Neolithic. They have the in, oldest in language Europe. as well uh, yeah. that we know of. Um, mm. So yeah, their their roots go way way back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it it is it's it's fascinating really how you can uh, extract these things. Jane says yeah, Greeks had bull leaping absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and. Uh, Still bullfighting in Spain and in southern France, actually. There's still a couple of sure. places where they, uh, uh, where they yeah. do that. Disgusting so we've kind, we've kind of gone off on one and gone on quite a large arc around uh, uh, the subject of, of henges, sparked off by uh, the devil's quoits. I was going to mm. say the other thing about the devil's quoits. I said about mounting the bank and looking in. Another mm. aspect of... And it's quite unique because there are so few henges that are restored to this kind of condition that you go into the arena you 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 go into the center and then the feeling is reversed you've got a feeling of of, uh, of focus on you if you can imagine people around on 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 the banks you think well what am i going to do here to entertain the folks you can imagine whatever games it, it, it works in other words <laughs> it mm. works <laughs> It's true. Mm. Uh, Graham mentions phosphate analysis. That, that's that's true. I mean, we yeah. we should be able to uh, get good phosphate analysis of. Uh, you say human waste. <laughs> um, you know that the, the trouble with human waste is it's not on a big enough scale, uh, really. But you know, you can certainly you know you could say that if it was if, if it was a farm, uh, for example. Uh, you know, yeah. if somewhere was used for a lot of animals, then certainly in that instance, you should be able to pick up. Well, the that's it, but it's an analysis that's uh, been done so little because it's not. Mm. Uh, people have not been looking. Mm. I mean, if we if we if we were archaeologists now and we started looking, it would be one of the first things we we do mm. because that you know it's one of the answers we want to get. But for the most part, I don't think excavations mm. at Henges have uh, had that idea in mind at all. No. Um, you know. uh, no, and unfortunately, you can't just uh, randomly go and do these things yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, you do have to get permission to uh, to <laughs> to run tests and analyses, even if yeah. you're the ones who are paying for it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Dale, quite right. Uh, Stonehenge absolutely is pretty much the only uh, monument that has dressed stones in uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know. And, uh, and how big time uh, Stonehenge is a is a special case in in and of itself, uh, very separate from your normal arrangement of stones. Anything? More? Oh, age, date, Rupert. Uh, 
for the quoits. Well, yeah, from the well, from the quoits. Uh, uh, I remember somebody um, asking that way, way, way back, and uh, I okay. forgot to address um, it. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. think it was specific because it's like so many things. It is so so mm-hmm. difficult to. Uh, I, the other thing is, of course, it doesn't this. exist on its own. There's quite a complex around uh, in that area around the uh, yeah, yeah. that area um, near Whitney, sort of west of uh, Oxford. There's loads, uh, it, loads of uh, mostly round barrows, which. Uh, Dates whatever those remains are, mostly sort of round about Bronze Age, but so I can tell you that the uh, charcoal extracted from Stonehole F two two seven, if you want me to be specific, <laughs> uh, layer yeah. five, that gave a date of plus or minus seventy years, four thousand one hundred and sixty five years ago, so two thousand eight hundred and ninety. 2620 BC. Yeah. Um, so uh, that answers the question of uh, being roughly contemporary with Avebury and, you know, with the yeah. be- beginnings um, of the last phase of Stonehenge. And well, not the last I'm phase. Just but looking through. Building uh, so, for example, um, antler fragments from, uh, from uh, uh, one of the ditch layers. Yeah. Uh, the antler fragments were dated uh, 2120 BC. So, so the antler fragments are uh, some 700 years after the stone, uh, the stones were in place. Now, the implication of that is just that well, it was constantly being repaired. Yes. Uh, you know, so these are tools from 700 years down the line. Yeah. Um, there was a red deer antler pick in Stonehole F17, and that was dated to 2580 BC. So that's 300 years after the stones were okay. put in. Uh, so, yes. you know, it's interesting. It gives you an example, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yes, Matt, uh, Stanton Harcourt is the uh, uh, village that it is very near to. Um, and it's not as... Uh, if you ever intend to visit it, it's not that easy to access in the, in the right way because there are no signs telling you where to go or anything like that. Uh, let, uh, let Google Earth or Google Maps be your friend. <laughs> yes. Yes, don't do what we did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, should we tell them what we did? Yeah, well, we we drove into an industrial estate because we looked on the map. That was the quickest way to get there. Yeah, and uh, and so we parked. We, it, it did, in all honesty, it did say that it was not open to the public, <laughs> and so we we drove down this. Uh, we drove down this lane. Well, we don't worry about things like that because we know that we're not going to be damaging anything. And uh, and so we just parked out of the way um, and we did what we wanted to do. And then we came out and found out that we'd been locked into this industrial estate. <laughs> yes. And everyone had gone home. There was nobody there. So we, we went out. We could, uh, we could actually walk around uh, the fencing and we managed to find one person in a warehouse uh, or a workshop and uh, and asked if he could help us, and he said, "Well, you're very lucky. I was just looking up to go home, you know." And then we really would have been stuffed. Anyway, the man came out. He saw the dilemma that we had, and he went off and got an angle grinder and he cut the locks off the uh, <laughs> the gate that was locked. He just cut them off. And we said, "Can we give you any money for that?" He said, "No, nah, don't worry about it. I'll tell him they'll be all right." Um, and <laughs> that, that, that was it. That was it. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was one of those yeah. moments where you think, ooh, what happens next <laughs> when you're stuck one side of a gate and you're <laughs> always sleeping in the car? Oh, dear, oh, dear. With no yes. beer. Mm. With no beer. No. Uh, have a great time at uh, Rudston Spike. Yeah, if you've not been before, that's uh, that's a terrific thing to stand next to the Rudston Monolith, isn't it? Yeah, it is. 
Yeah. It is very important. And use your imagination about the, all the curses around that site as, as well. Uh, uh, there's mm. absolutely nothing to see on, on the ground. Um, but, uh, yeah, ha ha have, have a look and uh, do a search on uh, the Gypsy Race. Uh, and uh, that you know, there's a bit of a sacred landscape thing going on, if you want to call it sacred. But there's certainly a complication in the landscape of uh, of stuff that is absolutely fascinating to do with the gypsy. Ro I think that's the name of the river, isn't it? The stream that comes down past Rudston. It's the gypsy race, of, yes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, sort of almost uh, you know past the church and and everything. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm. Uh, I think I've exhausted myself now. <laughs> I have juggled many things. Yeah, well done, Sassoir. You have. You. You. I, I. I. doff my cap. I will buy you another beer when we are on the same patch of land. Yeah, and I have to say, um, hats off to Ecam Live. It may have crashed, but it didn't lose the program. Mm. I had to exit Ecam Live and come back in. And it said, "Do you want to re resume the the broadcast?" I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, so dear. we did. Yes. Uh, folks, thank you so much. That was a fascinating evening. Thank you for your uh, your questions. If you've yeah. got anything else uh, you'd like to... Uh, um, Graham says, oh, I think you can see some, some one of the curses is on the ground. Um, we didn't manage it when we were there. That's all I can say. Uh, That's true. Yeah. No, we didn't. Um, yeah. Although it's also fair to say that we didn't have a huge amount of time to go looking. Um, yeah. Tis true. We could have spent longer. Yeah. Anyway, well, let us know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. It's been great to see you. Thanks for all your yeah. questions and uh, keeping us on the ball, uh, etc. Uh, thanks Thank for you your are. patience as well while we figured yeah. things out. And with that, we will say uh, ta for now. Cheers. Bye-bye. See you next time.